Well, I'd like to start my thanking Mel for taking us to the dark side. <laughs> um, how, many, how many people here have had a bet online or in a, in a bookmakers in the last year? Put a hand up, please. I'm impressed. <laughs> now, you see, this is, this, is an, this, is, it, it, this will reflect my talk. It's an interesting division. So, are you perhaps uh, uh, someone who supports the rational recreations or uh, irrational risk? Are you a person who goes for vice or virtue? Are you a person who goes for respectability or the unrespectability of gambling? Do you go for conspicuous consumption? Are you careful with your cash? And you know, do you look to the bookmaker or the bishop? I'm, I'm, I'm trying a bit of tactics at the moment. Are, you know, are you a church goer or a pub goer? Uh, because that, that sort of division we see there reflects uh, the traditional divisions over gambling uh, and, and, and the views of British society right through the interwar years and actually through the, through the war, both the First and Second World Wars as well. So, um, is it gambling in the time of war? What did, what did people think of it then? What was its place <coughs> in British society in those war years between 1939 and 1945? How do I get this over? Press it down. No, it won't do it. Yeah, it, it will. It's all right. I'll go the other way. Right. Uh, what, what, what can you look at to find out about gambling? Uh, if you want to do a PhD on this, there is a huge amount of material. You can look at the mass observation surveys, which start, you know, from the, from the 30s. You can look at the parliamentary discussions in Hansard, and you'll see debates about gambling running through the war years. Um, if you look at the parties, the, the Conservatives by and large are pro-gambling, uh, the, the Liberals have mixed sort of views, the Labour Party, interesting, despite being the People's Party, and the people mostly do like gambling, are the party most opposed to gambling right through this period. Nearly all, many of the Labour Party come from uh, Protestant, uh, non-conformist backgrounds, and their view of gambling is, is extremely negative. Uh, we can see the files of the Church's Council on Gambling, which has taken over the role of what was the National Anti-Gambling League, which was the powerful organisation in the, in, the, in the first decades of the 20th century. You can look at the British, you can look at newsreels who talk about the pools and so forth quite regularly. You can see, look at the files of the British Home Office, the Cabinet of the Official Records, sports organisation minutes like the FA uh, or rugby, who all have attitudes to gambling. There are betting surveys, there's substantial coverage in the print, there's editorials, anti-betting sermons in the church, there's crime reports. I could write at least three PhDs on this topic just for the, just for the, just for the, just for the, just for the war years. Uh, so, Plen there is plenty there for to go at. Um, and where do I want to start? Well, always, always, always start, always start at the beginning. Uh, let's just have let's let's just have a couple of very brief stories. Um, 19, 1940. Uh, the German bombing bombing attack on the airfields of southern England is on its way out. Uh, and the derby is run. Not held at Epsom like it should be, but held at Newmarket, out in the country, well away from many big urban areas. There's still maybe 60,000 people attend, despite the petrol shortages and rationing and all the rest. Uh, and the newsreels cover it, and they, 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 use it as a, they, they use it as an icon of Britishness. And the, you, you, hear, you hear the, the German Stukas, you, um, you hear Hitler ranting away in the background. And in the midst of all this, you see the, the, the race finish, uh, and, 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 and rule Britannia, and all the, the whole thing is a beautiful you know, me metaphor for, you know, for, English, for, you know, for English resistance to, to the Nazi jackboot. And it finishes with, well, that's won the race, now let's win the war. So you, you can see that the message there. Or, or, or let's take another little story. Stories are illust illustrative, aren't they? Uh, 19, 19, 1942, Sol uh, Salisbury race course, one of the few race courses the, go the government is now allowing to be still open and running to keep racing alive. Uh, by now, all the iron is being collected everywhere. 
with people are tearing up the railings, you know, that lovely garden you had with its, you know, lovely rails is all, this, the rails have disappeared, your pots and pans have been, no more cooking pots and pans taken in, all, all the gardening equipment is disappearing <laughs> off, to be melted down for the war effort. This is bollocks, but, but, it, <laughs> but it, it doesn't matter, because that, that's how it is. Uh, and of course, then the, the people of Salisbury, in the midst of all this great effort, Look to the race course. The race course is surrounded by metal rails. And it's got a grandstand covered in rails. <coughs> and, and at that point, they can see the target ahead of them collect, collect all the iron in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the race course for the war effort. And uh, the, the churches have a campaign to get the metal from the race course in. Uh, the jockey club, you know, the, the local aficionados of racing, uh, write their letters to the press. The letters go backwards and forward. The, the, the local paper prints them all. You know, this is the greatest thing that's happened to Salisbury in years. Uh, and at the end of the day, they failed to collect the railings. The, 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 the government say they don't want the railings. Salisbury is one of the few race courses still allowed with the run, and they're going to keep it. It would be bad for morale if this course, the course couldn't run anymore because all the railings had gone. So there are, there are t both of those have little messages about a, a sense that racing, at least as one gambling medium, may be, may be important. So um, let, let's come back to morale. Uh, if, if you look to literature on morale in the war, in, by, from about 1951-50 onwards, uh, historians create the view that uh, British morale during the Second World War was high. You know, by and large, that was, it, they have a positive message to tell. Uh, there are debates about what morale is, uh, how it might operate, the visible, you know, visible signs, invisible signs, how you might assess it, how you might measure it. So uh, historians are, are looking to discuss it, but what they, what they decide in general, right up to the 70s and the 80s, is that uh, generally they're, they're painting a very positive image of British morale. Uh, but by and large, they don't talk about they don't talk about recreation at all. There's very little on things like the role of the cinema, uh, you know, uh, any of the leisure activities, the sport that's going on during the war years. Uh, and then after a while, a revisionist position starts to appear in the in the in the work on morale, and that begins to to, to tease out some of the complexities, um, some of the subtleties, sort of the nuances about. How, how morale might have worked during the Second World War. They, they point to the activities of black marketeers and so forth. And they begin, they begin to argue that mor morale wasn't this sort of oversimplistic image and that we, they need to look at, at some of its complexities in things like recreation. And we start to see work on things like the cinema and so forth. And in a sense, I'm picking up on this now in, in, in looking at betting as another example of how betting might have functioned as, as a positive role at a time of wartime when, when everything is bad and you want a little lightness and excitement. Maybe, maybe that element of risk in gambling, the, the, the possibility which you can't get to your job at that time and the long hours, that possibility, maybe a little, just that little big win for one week. You know, when your 15 to 1 shot comes up, you know, m might, might have had a positive role. And the extent to which the government might or might not have thought that. So I began to try and look at that. Okay, so down there, we, what we see is that betting had changed by the time of the Second World War. There had been a whole series of new betting innovations. The first, of course, keeping an eye on time always, was the, fo was the football pools. Uh, the football pools, uh, the first pools really, really start to come on in the modern form about 1921, 22, which is when uh, the, what, what will be Littlewood's firm starts to develop. Uh, uh, by, by the early 1930s, you know, put the pools are growing. By the 1938, they're already playing a massive role in British society. Um, men and women sit down together sometimes, you know, to, to fill in the pools coupons. Uh, people rip, purchase lucky charms that might help them to win the pools. It's, it's, it's become a function and uh, looking for the football results, even for those who aren't interested in football, becomes uh, a, a big thing on a, on a Saturday. People buy their, buy their postal orders and send them in during the week, you know. Uh, and another one, of course, is the mechanical 
uh, dog racing. Uh, up to that time, the main dog racing form had been hair coursing on open fields with two dogs competing against each other. Not to catch the hair, incidentally, although clearly they do sometimes. <coughs> By and large, they don't never did catch the hair for more for more than a for more proportioned times. But the competition between two dogs, with the judge giving marks for, for the way the hairs actually carry out the activity, uh, being the main betting form. Places like uh, the Waterloo, Alcar, the Waterloo Cup, and so forth. But then mechanical, mechanical dog racing comes in first in Manchester in 1926, and then spreads through the country from 27, 28 onwards. Uh, we've got the standard forms of betting. We've got the new form of betting in British race courses, which is the totalisator, which Ray will know all about. Uh, which again comes in about that time. So betting is changing and actually it's becoming more popular in British society. The proportion of people's spare cash spent on betting is going up from round about maybe one or two percent to <coughs> about five percent of recreational spending. So it's becoming more significant. Uh, and, but within that, of course, you've got these divisions of cultural attitudes to betting, different uh, class resentments, different, for example, upper class, upper class jockey club might be one attitude, uh, as against uh, the pools is a different sort of attitude. Uh, you've got class resentments, you've got religious faith, particularly non-conformity, uh, with the Church of England much more mixed position, whereas Catholics in general uh, were much more accommodating to betting. Um, you've got political leanings, as I've said before, with the Labour Party, particularly the ILP group being particularly anti-betting. Uh, so what, what you have is a complex matrix of shifting consideration and interest. So when the war starts uh, and, and all these forms of activity on which betting is based, horse racing, dog racing, you know, the pools and so forth, then they become a focus for debate because each of them have, are problematic in terms of British society in 1939 once the war starts. Uh, okay. The first we really, they're all, at first everything is majorly affected. All horse racing initially closes down because they're afraid of bombing. Dog racing closes down. These are in urban areas quite often and the Germans are going to fly over tomorrow and bomb the hell out of them. So everything, initially everything closes down. Um, and of course, we have the pools. Little Woods, Little Woods, for example, just one pools company. One pools company alone. Now, many pools companies at this time. Uh, all very large, the, the, the big, maybe maybe 30 large pools companies and others quite small. But Little Woods alone employs about 23 women, 23,000 rather women, 23,000 women and maybe several hundred men. It's a major, it's a major, on its own it is a major employer in Liverpool, quite apart from, you know, Vernon's and all the rest. It's, so, it, it's shut down. And of course, immediately there are debates about this. And, 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 it, and of course, it's attacked for all sorts of things. Th those who are opposed to gambling hit that because we've got to think of a new argument. We haven't managed to stop the pools before. Let's find a new way of attacking it. <coughs> Equally, there are those who are for the war effort who want to attack it anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's argued that it's, uh, this should, people shouldn't be uh, working on this when it should activity should be turned to the war effort, that it's a huge waste of paper, it's a huge waste in terms of the post office, it's taking scarce resources and being put on vans and driven around London and everywhere else, you know, the post office is taking up with selling postal orders and cashing postal orders and all the rest, and it should be stopped. How long did that last? That's for about two months. At, at that point, uh, the government's being lobbied by the pools companies and by those elements in British society who want the pools back. And very quickly you see a new form of pools, Unity Pools emerge, which is very beneficial for Liverpool actually, because Unity Pools, what a misnomer that is, because it kicks out most of the pools companies. It's Unity Pools is actually Little Woods, Vernon's and, and about seven or eight others. Uh, who now publish their, publish their coupons in the newspapers. Now, isn't that a waste of paper? No, because the newspapers uh, are struggling to find advertising during the war. They have to fill their columns somehow and they need advertising payments. So the unity pools companies will pay the newspapers to put the coupons in and then these coupons are collected uh, on a regional basis and work from there. So that reduces the cost in all sorts of ways. 
Um, so Little, Little Woods uh, quite, quite quickly starts to play a new role in unity pools, meanwhile giving up much of its factory space for things like parachutes. It starts to manufacture parachutes in much of its now non-used plant. So Little Woods becomes an interest, an, a, one of the first interesting cases. M meanwhile, dog racing and horse racing are, are still struggling because they're still banned, but quite quickly uh, the, the government starts to think again. Uh, and, and you can see how what happens throughout the rest of the war, and I'm summarising briefly rather than giving a detailed account of the changes. Uh, what you see is, uh, that's if we start with the figures, Greyhound National Talk turnover, uh, which is 40 million in 1938, drops to 32 million in 1939 and then it starts to go up again and that's because although the government shuts down the, the, all the dog race initially quite quickly it starts to open them up again first of all it says each, each, each of these grounds can only open one day a week but equally it says they have to, they have to operate during daytime which then stops any costs of, you know, night time and so forth. Uh, but what happens is that more people go, more people spend money. And you can see the figures there quite clearly. You're seeing a quite, a, a quite sharp rise. In 32, 40 million in 1938, it's a slight, there's a diminution initially in 1939, thanks to the war beginning <coughs> later in the year. Uh, down to 30 million in 1940, but after that it's, it's coming back up again quite quickly. Uh, it's back to into war levels by 1941, it's grown to 50 million in 42, 74 million in 1944 is 104 tracks, and it's racing one day a year for much of the war. So you can see uh, significant in rare like statistics, and I, I think these are quite illuminating statistics about the place of dog racing in British society, and it's actually changing its nature. Uh, equally, um, although although there are you know, lotteries that disappeared by and large in Britain, uh, they're still operating in the in Ireland, and you can see there that uh, there are still <coughs> British winners in the Irish hospital sweepstakes. sweepstakes. These, these are coming over from Dublin and being sold in pubs and elsewhere, and people are still buying them. And you can see it was 30. It was about 50% before the war. It's 37% in 40, uh, and then by 1945, it's back to back up to over 50%. The, the Irish sweepstakes sold in America, in in Europe, and in and and the island, obviously. So 50% is, is quite a significant amount. Um, football pools have changed to unity pools. Again, you're seeing a a, 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 a drop and then a rise again. Uh, but nowhere near pre-war pre -war levels. And that's because of the difficulty of organisation and collecting, by and large. It's, it's much more difficult to do it. So, so the pools do suffer more than, more than anything else. And of course, horse races are fewer. Um, 1939, there were 331 days of racing, 1940, 152 days. And by, by eight, 1942, 80 days, there were only five courses. So, but people are still able to bet. What, what we forget is that Ireland, because it's error, is neutral and they're still having races on Irish tracks and, and the newspapers are constantly publishing details of racing results. But it's not just English racing, it's Irish racing too. Equally so you have, oh, many of the papers throughout the war have a forecast for the racing, they have betting, they have betting forecasts for dog racing and they equally have lots of pools material. So newspapers do not stop publishing their predictor data. You know, nearly all newspapers have betting forecasts and things, and it's there right the way through the war. It's still, it's still a major element of, of, our, of our, our sort of society. Um, so, yes, yes, racing, ra racing, racing, racing does, racing does particularly well, but not in the way it did. It's surviving in different forms. So, you wouldn't have thought that if you'd read the press or looked at the media, because um, when we looked at the division here, about 50% of you betted, about 50% of you didn't, but some, some of you might have been in that list, but a relatively small group uh, of folk who are very active in opposition to gambling. 
and the group who are who are opposed to gambling before the war, groups like the Church Council Committee Against Gambling and so forth, the old <coughs> gambling groups in, across society are very vociferous. They are, they make a lot of noise. As we know from our students, lots of noise does not mean <laughs> <laughs> lots, lots of noise does ne not necessarily mean great significance. And what, what we see here is that, uh, that there is, from the, those groups who were opposed betting before the war, uh, ally themselves to see ac any activity in recreation which is not devoted to the war effort, it's unpatriotic. So you have two different sets of arguments. You have the arguments which are the traditional arguments of the anti-gamblers, which are to do, uh, first of all, with its immorality and its irrationality, and its uh, damage to families, wasted resources, impact on crime and so forth. Uh, so they're the traditional arguments, and I don't want to rehearse them particularly. You know. You, we would find them if I was writing about gambling at any point in the past. But there are also the arguments which now uh, both anti-gamblers and some of those people who want every bit of our effort devoted to the war effort and the completion of the war coming together, uh, playing off each other, feeding off each other. Um, so, so for example, you 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 see some of the arguments against um, the hair coursing, for example, which is now, uh, people will know, has been banned since 2005. Well, you, you see the same arguments then about its cruelty to the hair and so forth being advanced then, but then they're allied to people, you know, people gathering, gathering out on Alcar near Liverpool when they should be devoting the time to other things. And we can see cars there, and you know, they, 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 they develop a series of arguments about that. So, uh, so, uh, so, and then there's a third group which sees that betting might be okay, but all the profits should go to the war. And again, I haven't got time to de deconstruct this in detail, but you can see how th th there might be some rationality by saying the profits shouldn't go to these private companies. We need, we need to almost nationalize this, and we should have a sort of pools, but little mm. ones shouldn't get the money. All this should go into war bonds or, or something like that. So there's a, a series of arguments about gambling as a, as a rational, con this is a rational argument, isn't it? About contribution to war effort. Then you have the traditional ones, uh, the immoral ones, but then they find, they find a new argument, which is a patriotic argument about gambling as wasteful. And gambling as wasteful is a really, a really interesting one. Um, first of all, they say gambling is wasteful because it wastes acres of newsprint. Open your paper. Take a look. Look at that. Mm. You know, there's pages. You know, there's, there are all these coupons. There's, 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 the, there's, the, there's the guy giving his tips for Newmarket tomorrow. And what about this suggestions as to where you should put your cross for the pools there, uh, or you know, or, or a report on the dogs, predictions for the uh, Harringay Arena. And there, so look at the amount of paper that's wasting. Appalling! And then they'll, you know, they'll, they'll and petrol, petrol, you know, there, here we are, even doctors, doctors cannot get money for, for running the cars. Because, you know, it, 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 they have to apply, they have to get it. And now, look, this. There's, there's that racehorse trainer, he's got his two horses, and he's driving all the way from Newmarket to Salisbury, miles, wasting petrol. Look at that dog, dog. He's, he's got his dogs, and he's taking them from Harringay, right the way across to, to Wembley. Waste of petrol. So we, we start to get a, a, a whole discourse, which is, which is all about uh, materiality. <coughs> being exploited for non-war purposes. Um, <clears throat> wood pulp being wasted. And then, and then of course, there's the, uh, the, 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 whole la the whole lazy scroungers argument, which is about these people should be at work. Are they at work? No! 
every, you know, every bit of, the, the, nobody should be doing anything which is not part of the war effort. And there are people attending race meetings, there are people attending dog meetings, and these, and these are the dregs of society. People like Ray Van Plew, or me, going to the races, you know. <laughs> it's appalling. But, and you can see how, you know, how, how difficult that, that image is to, because, because it, it sounds, it sounds a very, it sounds a very sort of powerful, a very powerful image, you know. Uh, it's a scorn, it, the, whole, the whole thing is a squandering of war resources there, which, which should be devoted to sort of other, other area. Um, <laughs> it's Bison uh, Roundtree, who's the big name, you know, social reformer, Joseph Roundtree, he says, well, that neither too patriotic or too occupied with war work to neglect like their proper business. They say they're providing a much needed relaxation for the overworked masses and a short sighted government complacently acquiesces while Britain's being destroyed by vice and greed. So it is a. Uh, and. Uh, and, 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 and you get a bit of this even in the occasional newsreels. There's a puffy newsreel from 1941, uh, and, it sound, and, it, and, and the commentary, which is fascinating to, to watch and listen to, he says, it's difficult to believe that these tens of thousands of war workers who could be spared in midweek, and they're watching these Russian-fed thoroughbreds, these poor horses, the Russian-fed thoroughbreds, and that Use of petrol to bring in thousands of cars is, it can't be helpful to the war effort. Uh, it's plying in the decent face of decent public opinion, says Manny Shinwell. Of course he would say that, Manny Shinwell, remember the Labour MP? Uh, uh, to support such inane, insane and unseemly spectacles. Uh, so the, the, this, 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 this argument going on all the time about um, this, this, uh, I can't, I can't find the quote, but there's a beautiful one somewhere where, 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 where this bloke says, "Well, I looked and this is when, uh, in, in the car coming away from, the, the cars coming away from Epsom, this is a real great quote, were full of Jews and foreigners. So we've got anti-Semitism and racism. You can't, how the hell you can see what's in the car and tell the Jews and foreigners? God only knows." Uh, well, he would, wouldn't he? But, but, uh, but you, you, you know that that sort of that sort of discourse, which is un, you know, which which is racist, which is Semitic, and you know, which it, it's it, it's it's it, there's a lot of that sort of stuff going on alongside. So there's a whole there's a whole range of things. Uh, and 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 one of the things, of course, is the fact that they're enjoying themselves. You know, so enjoying becomes almost something to be disapproved of. And people are enjoying themselves rather than devoting themselves to ending the war quicker. And and when you read it, you can see that it, this is this is a deeply felt feeling, and it is one which catches the mood of some of the British people. And as I say, and you find it in things like even like occasional newsreels, as in as in much of the press. Uh, yet and yet and yet. Um, Even, even occasional <clears throat> people start to pick it up. Stafford Crisp, I'm going to you remember, he was a, a, a big name at that time in the government. Uh, but by the time we get 1942, when Britain's still, you know, struggling to survive, um, the war is still not going well in 1942. And Stafford Crisp says, uh, he, who doesn't like dog racing, he says, it's completely out of accord with the true spirit of determination of the people. It shouldn't be allow allowed to offend the solid and serious determination of the country to achieve victory. So there's still this rhetoric, even in some figures in government. But that is not the government view. It's, uh, it's, it's not the dominant government view. Uh, because the government does see that betting can have, can have, can have positive things too. And alongside that, by 1942, the press is starting to shift. It starts to develop new arguments which become much more foregrounded than previously about, about the extent to which the anti-betting arguments have the power which they appear to have for a short time. Uh, for example, people, uh, people start to point out that, uh, hang on a minute, all this waste of paper. Well, have you not seen similar adverts every week? Every paper's full of cinema adverts. Isn't that a waste of paper too? Are you going to take that out? What about all the church adverts? They, 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 they start, what about football? Uh, football prints, admission tickets, it has programs every week. Are you going to stop all those as well? If, hang on, you can't, just have, you can't just pick out your betting. You've got to pick out the rest. 
um, the, 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 the point out too, yes, yes, you know, the transport's used for, for horse street. We say it's another entertainment form. Transport used for all the other things. When people go to the, the, the theatre or cinema, they, they use public transport. Isn't that a waste of time? Are you going to ban that as well? Uh, they pick out the notion that uh, the spectators should be at work and they, and, they, and they start to deconstruct and provide evidence for the type of spectator who's actually at these, at these dog races and the horse races and so forth. Instead of just accepting what the anti gambling anti arguments say, they start to break down the argument and provide evidence to say, actually that is not the case. And they, 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 they show that uh, quite often it's weekends, it's half days, bank holidays when racing's on, uh, Quite a lot of the spectators are local, quite often they're in uniform, and nearly all of them are attending in their own time, not in work time. Why, sh why shouldn't people be allowed to spend time out to work on leisure activities that they choose? Um, other writers point out again that resources are used by all animals, including pets. So instead of accepting the fact that these dogs are having other horses are being fed rations which should be going to people, they say, well, hang on, have you got any pets? Do you have a dog? Do you have a cat? Do you have a gerbil? You've got a gerbil. <laughs> uh, so, but, but, so all the, quite slowly over that period, 19, by, 19, you know, by, by 1942, the arguments, the, the arguments against gambling, which were the, what I call the patriotic arguments, is against the traditional uh, moral and social, uh, are, are being challenged with, with, with data. Um, you, you see, regularly you get cartoons in the press which still feature gambling during the war. I just provided this one, which is a, which where this, this is meant to be the book. bookmakers always had, you know, were, were always portrayed as corpulent, smoking cigars, being bejeweled, you know, uh, carrying carrying his binoculars and so forth. Uh, was hitting pretty hard. He used to walk back the races. Now he has to walk both ways. It's because he, you know, there's no pedal anymore for him to get there, presumably. Um, or you, you, you can't. This is this is again the the document which I got the Derby thing where it says we agree with the authorities that war workers should have occasional recreation, but we find it difficult to believe that these tens of thousands are war workers who spare. So I don't need to read you that. But it's that's the sort of material you get when you go to um, places like Pathé and, 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 and get the words often in their original form and were typed out. Uh, and this, of course, is, 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 uh, is, 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 is an attack on Crips. Uh, one, and, and in a sense, it's ironic, because here we have these dogs that now aren't killing hares, and then and the two dogs are saying themselves, one day that Crips, the guy who was, you know, complaining about dog racing, may turn us loose into a real field with a real fair, with a real hare, you know. So that's sort of excitement there. Um, so it is quite ironic. So what you're seeing is that the that, that the government starts starts to be much more vociferous, uh, really from about 1941 onwards, up through 1942, and into the early 1943 about about why they should continue to maintain a gambling industry in the face of wartime. Um, local authorities don't withdraw dog licences. They, they could. Local authorities have the chance to withdraw a drug license for a statement at any time. The fact is, they didn't. If local authorities had wanted dog racing closed down, it didn't need government, it can be done by any local authority withdrawing its license. Just ask for the pub. Uh, BBC continues to provide racing results and comedies on dog and horse races. Uh, the Home Secretary attacks anti gamblers for pushing personal opinion and personal intolerance. He says betting is a lubricant and not a break on the war machine. So, so the Home Office, uh, which traditionally had been fairly, you know, non-committal about gambling because they wanted to be straddled the fence. They didn't want to offend anti-gamblers, nor did they want to push gambling too hard. Either was dangerous. Both lost votes. Whichever way you jumped, it's a bit like salsa, isn't it? You know, <laughs> whichever, whichever way you jump, you get. Uh, it was dangerous. So by and large, the Home Office had tried not to say too much about gambling. It now, uh, Morrison's being much more 
outspoken in a way. He's, he's supporting gambling much more than previous, you know, Home Office ministers had. He says betting is a lubricant and not a break. And the derby is being seen as iconic. Uh, so, and, and again, we get the same sorts of arguments from the government that's been coming before from the general public um, about, about all these sorts of things. Okay. Well, why did betting survive then? I think it's, I think it's fairly clear. Uh, it's uh, government that couldn't accept that betting needed regulation. In other words, to be controlled during the war and managed during the war, but they didn't want it. They didn't want it to be banned. What they wanted to do was re reduce the amount of resources used for it to within a reasonable level, but maintain it consistently. Uh, the other thing is a class argument. What you see emerging in the Home Office documents, particularly, uh, not in public, but in the documents within the Home Office, what you read is that uh, the, 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 that more traditional feeling, for example, where the racing was supported by the jockey club, and the jockey club was run by the, the rich, the aristocratic, the powerful, many of whom had places in the House of Lords, uh, and were always, were always able to get the ear of government, and often, often could influence government, for example, to maintain racehorse breeding during the war. Uh, the, the Home Office is aware of that sort of political power for the jockey club, but they're anxious not to, not to make the people <coughs> in inverted commas, feel that uh, the government's on the side of the elite, that you know the people are equally important and that we should you know, what we don't want what we don't want to do is that betting is treat one betting form differently to another. Uh, we, we can we, if we ban dog racing we've got to ban racing too. And that sort of sense that betting betting has a, a clear class dimension but they don't want to intervene in class terms. Even though I you know, I know they're a government, the National Union, but they're a conservative government in, in many ways. Uh, that, that class feeling comes across very much in the Home Office documentation, where you read, where you see the sort of marginal comments and things. Um, the Ministry of Home Security says bans would not be in the national interest, and they did help Moran morale. The Ministry of Agriculture, you see, each group's intervening from a position of its own departmental strategy. So the Ministry of Agriculture said, well we, we could we could actually cut the fodder for horse for horses and dogs. And if we did that, it would save half an egg per person a year. Do you want to do that? <laughs> you know, they, they, they start to make it sound ridiculous. Um, the, the relationship between jockey club and government's good uh, and the thoroughbred breeding industry seemed to be a national asset. But again, although the anti gambling organisations, the churches, lobbied the government regularly to the war, and they lobbied the public regularly during the war, this, they, they simply largely put forth the traditional anti gambling views about, as I said, about its morality and about its social, possible social consequences. They, they don't come up with anything new, so their lobbying has little effect. But what you also see is all the betting organisations, you know, Little Woods and all the rest, have a much closer relationship with the government, and they they provide information, they provide lobbying uh, to to the various governmental departments <coughs> quite consistently. So they're they're trying to make their case alongside the anti gambling organisations in a way which had been growing through the interwar years, but now becomes more more significant. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is they're also very publicly help help the war effort. They they make great plays, for example, the whether it's the, the, the various race meetings uh, or the dog racing organisations. They give charity donations quite regularly uh, to the war effort or the hospitals, and they publicise these like mad because publicity helps their case. And you see consistent charity donations. Uh, but very well publicised in the local press. You know. So a local race meeting will say, well, the first race today uh, and the, the selling of programmes will be given, all the money will be given to. You know, and so that's, that's very consistent. Or they let the premises on the grounds be used to help uh, and, and they make them available. So Littlewoods, as I say, are a prime example in letting, letting their, their factories be used for the war purposes. Equally, many of the stadiums do things where um, official activities are allowed to use the stadium for, for war-related purposes. Um, okay, so 
I'm nearly finished. I want to just finish with, with, with one. That gives you a sense of the, of the morale side. But one thing I haven't talked about, and that's because I can't, is um, I know almost nothing about who bets during the war. And uh, people, you know, I keep asking myself, well, I've got, I've got all this data about it, but I don't know much about the actual betting. I have the figures, but individuals and it, 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 that data disappears. And the reason for it disappearing is because uh, when, I, when I wrote about gambling in, in the interwar period for work out the for example, <coughs> horse racing, you can find out about who gambles because you have data. You have uh, the police, for example, prosecute betting ritually quite regularly. Uh, ready money betting is illegal, but everyone does it. And what the police by and large do is once a year they'll prosecute that bookmaker and the rest of the time they'll leave him alone. Partly because he pays, sometimes he bribes them, but quite often he's just, it's just a ritual prosecution. So when you have the prosecution, uh, you know, they, they often identify people. Uh, so you know the sorts of people who are caught in gambling, anti-gambling operations by the police. Uh, when, when people win on the pools, you get the list of the pools people, who they are, where they came from, what jobs they did, how old they were. So there, for all sorts of reasons, there's plenty of data about who has been gambling. Now, in the war, you have, that data disappears. First of all, the police stop prosecuting gambling. That's not because it's not happening. The police see their, see their role. Uh, since many of the police force have joined the army, and the police that's, that's left is, 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 not, is, is a shadow of his former self, uh, they, they, they find that they have to make contingent decisions about what they address and what they don't. And they don't address gambling. Very, very rarely do they do it. And when they do, quite, quite often magistrates dismiss the cases. Because they say, why are you doing this? You should be doing something else. And they, they just, they, quite, quite often you see uh, magistrates being very unsympathetic to gambling prosecutions, even though it's legal. So I, I can't get data on that side of things. I can't get data on who wins. Uh, although I know that um, the Irish hospital sweepstakes, there are winners. By and large, the papers don't print it because they're reserving the print, which is now scarce, and the paper, which is now scarce, for more, impo more important, inverted commas, war news. So I know, f I know a lot about the debate. I know a lot about the statistics and the figures. I know very little at all about the world of gambling during the war, nearly all the data which would allow me to access that area has disappeared. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. I'm just tweeting that if you want any help on that, then somebody should get a hold of you. Okay. All right, any questions for Mike? Yeah, Mark, then Alison and Alex. Huh? Thanks very much. What did on the topic of who was um, betting, it strikes me that actually the war was a heyday for betting because you had civilians and particularly airmen who were living sort of riskier, chancier lives who maybe were more uh, of a mind to sort of uh, gamble. Well, you see, if you look at the army, there have always been gambling in the army and you see that uh, right, right, across, right across history that... Um, and in Palestine during the war, they're, they're running pools, pools for the army in Palestine, for example. Uh, so, so, and in a sense, people come into the army carrying over the, the, the betting experience from civilian life into the army. So you're absolutely right. The, the army's right with gambling. But again, we have no data on it. Well, I can see it's going on from you know, occasional references, but the amount of data is quite minimal. Alison? I was, I, I was interested by a whole load of things in that talk, but one thing that piqued my interest was the Irish reports, reports on Irish web racing. Um, so I think that, you know, the movement or the interconnections between one country and That's another right. are really interesting. That's right. So I'm interested to hear a bit more about that, and particularly whether, you know, how extensive it was, um, the, the interest in Irish racing in Britain during the war. And, and what the nature and tone of the reports are like, and, and how closely it was 
I, I, Irish racing goes on as it had gone on before the war because there's no, there's no real fear for Irish racing, so the, so the data is there. And because because there's only 80 days of racing uh, in, in, in England, uh, bookmakers uh, were very keen to find find new ways of you know increasing the betting market, and so they were very keen to start publishing. Uh, um, anti-post prices, for example, on Irish races. Most of the time, the, the, the people betting on it kind of had no knowledge at all on on form, on going, you know, all, all the sort of data that you might use to make a, a more rational betting decision here in England, where you had some sense of jockeys, riders going, you know, uh, horses with a horse's breathing, it's, it's, it's past performance. Uh, but what you start to see as the time goes on is the papers start to produce some of this data in the way they had for English racing from Ireland, so which allows which which allows those that want to follow it perhaps make slightly more sensible betting decisions. So depending on which newspaper you read, some it it, it, it differs. Sometimes it's quite minimal. And it's just the racing results or or who's which which horses are running today. Sometimes there are, there are quite detailed reports. Of you know, yesterday's rating from Punchdown or wherever it might be, so it, it's, it, it varies from paper to paper, mm -hmm. and of course this, uh, the papers with a more sporting turn of mind produce more data. Alex, got like a, a small and a big question. A small oh one kind of going on from Alison was, do you get the anti-gamblers sort of reinforcing the it's not rational because, like say in football, you've got all these scratch teams of whichever players you can pull together. Hence, like how can you rationally bet? try and predict results, do they sort of make that argument? And then sort of like the bigger question was, do you have a sense of sort of, uh, it seems to be like gambling has a good war, like sport has a good war in the Second World War, do you have any idea of like whether gambling had a, a bad war in the First World War by comparison at all? I've not really researched the First World War, so I can't ask that question easily. I, I, I do think gambling, uh, so it, it, it suffered at the start because of restrictions and everything, but w what it does is it, it starts to reorganise itself and repackage itself and find, find markets it hadn't had before. And a good example is the pools where, from, from all accounts, and I, I'm only, and I have no, again, no data to know for sure, but the impression I get from the church council reports and elsewhere is that more women are filling in pools, coupons, during the war as, as a proportion. But again, it's only a... It's only a <coughs> I have no data except second-hand, you know, so <coughs> observations. Yeah. Ob other people's observations. I don't know. I don't know for sure, but I suspect that might well be the case. So, so, so that, that's an. I think, by and large, gambling has a pretty good war in the Second World War. If you look at the last figures, it allows allows gambling to take off again. That's why you see dog racing and horse racing after the Second World War has a boom period up to about 1949-50. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah, and it so it, so it, and it and it booms because it's it it's it's had uh, a sort of flight time that's allowed it to be already on an ascending ascending pattern. Gary, I'm interested. Uh, I think the sort of the sort of international situation is was the same sort of thing happening in other allies, maybe Australia or, or elsewhere on the continent, perhaps in general. I don't. I don't. I don't know. So that's, an, that's, that's another interesting question, which I haven't looked at at all, so I don't know. <laughs> Paul, and then Ryan. And I'm interested, going back to the political uh, thing that the Labour Party was so anti-gambling and the, the government generally was, was uh, supportive of, of gambling. What was the main reason that the government was supportive? Was, was it to do with morale? Was that the, the key that, argument? That's the, yeah. my, that, that's the message you get from nearly all the references. They're trying to support gambling. Mm -hmm. uh, and, they, and they see it as having a positive effect, uh, which is not what the anti-gamblers say. The anti-gamblers consistently say it has a ne negative effect upon morale, mm -hmm. but they provide absolutely no evidence to support that. Okay, and for the Labour Party, was it a morality issue? It's a, it's, it, well, what you see is that many of the members of the Labour Party came through the, the non-conformist background, mm -hmm. uh, and it, that's a very, you know, if you look, if you look at those who get into the Labour Party, quite <coughs> often they're supporters of temperance, mm -hmm. not always, but quite often they're supporters of temperance, they're quite often uh, anti-gambling, you know, and, 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 and that comes from their, their young their youth from experience in churches, in Sunday schools, uh, uh, they're often as, sometimes as preachers in mm -hmm. Methodist chapels and elsewhere. And so they, so they come in with a negative 
negative view Im 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 imbibed from that long tradition within the Protestant Church, mm -hmm. and, and they carry that through. Even even though even though um, they 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 do feel <coughs> they can see that their public their the voters don't support them, mm -hmm. but they, they they say they're taking a moral stand. Sure. Right. The answer about Australia is that each state government was responsible for race and not the national government and they wanted it to continue because most ethnic in Australia was through the TAB system which is virtually nationalised. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a government fundraiser. But the, the, that's what well, it's national. Basically the talks on the national stood requires our nationalised That's fine, industry. pretty much. Well, what, what was their experience? And again the, the talk figures go up. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you're seeing a rise in talk, even though there's less, less racing, even though, even though there's less horse racing for example, talk figures grow. Partly because bookmakers find it difficult to get around the country in the way they did before the war. So, so that because there are fewer bookmakers, you know, the, 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 the talk begins to soak up more of the money available on the race course. That, that's where, of course, the money's coming in there. The talk's only coming in from the race course, not, not from the wider bookmaking community. Outside a few offices, I know there are a few offices elsewhere. The national stood though, because wasn't that Irish? Yes, just about. But uh, I, I've got no figures on that. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much, Mike.